Greetings to my colleagues, um, friends, and students, as well as uh, distinguished uh, keynote speakers at the uh, International Conference on Current Trends in ELT in um, Urumiye, Iran. I trust you're having a wonderful conference. I would like to thank the organizers of the conference, in particular Dr. Sadari, for inviting me to the conference. And I'm, um, I'd like to express my sincere apologies for not being able to attend the conference in person. Um, what I'm going to do in this talk today is to present a rather brief sketch of the paradigm of English as an international language as I see it. Um, I'd like to bring um, bits and pieces of uh, different strands of research um, that I believe are part of the bigger paradigm of English as an international language together. Of course, some of the people that I'm going to mention, some of the scholars may not associate themselves with the paradigm of English as an international language, but I see uh, their work as uh, consistent with the paradigm of English as an international language. Um, first, I'd like to start with the definition of the word paradigm. Um, the term paradigm is uh, largely associated with the name of the historian of science, Tom Schoon, uh, who viewed paradigm as the underlying uh, assumptions and intellectual structure upon which research and development in a field of inquiry is based. Um, but some other people have uh, given definitions of uh, paradigm as well, like Payton 1990, defines paradigm as a worldview, a general perspective, and a way of breaking down the complexity of the real world. Um, Bryman defines um, paradigm as a cluster of beliefs and dictates uh, which for scientists in a particular discipline influence what should be studied, how research should be done, and how results should be interpreted, and so on. I personally find this definition as a bit of imposition, as if you know, the paradigm dictates what a researcher should do and how they should um, interpret the results. This is a bit imposing, um, I find it um, a bit imposing. So I, I, I tried. Um, to give a definition of paradigm myself for humanities and social sciences that it's not as rigid as hardcore sciences. So I define paradigm in humanities and social sciences as a macro conceptual framework that serves as a basis for exploring aspects of a phenomenon, generating research questions and seeking practical solutions to problems in a particular field. Um, Paradigm is usually based on a set of observations about the phenomenon under study. Um, and I'll talk about the observations in relation to English as an international language um, a bit later. Um, usually the emergence of a new paradigm is associated either with a new frame of thinking about the phenomenon or um, results from certain um, changes to the nature of the phenomenon, or both. For example, in cognitive psychology, uh, 1970s, 60s, people uh, were thinking or conceptualizing mind in terms of memory in human, com I mean, sorry, um, uh, computers. But then um, the paradigm shift, the, the connectionism uh, paradigm um, changed the way uh, cognitive psychologists um, conceptualized mind in terms of brain neurons and connections and uh, mind as brain. So that was a change in the ways in which um, cognitive psychologists thought about the human mind. But sometimes it's the nature of the phenomenon under study that changes and requires a paradigm shift. And that's what happened uh, in the case of English. The 
EIL paradigm um, is partly reflected in the number of publications that have uh, emerged in recent years. Um, teaching English as an international language, uh, the struggle to teach English as an international language, international English and its sociolinguistics context, English as an international language perspective and pedagogical issues, English in the world, principles and practices of teaching English as an international language, pr pr principles and practices for teaching English as an international language, and English as an international language in Asia. So these publications, as you can see, um, kind of herald the uh, emergence of the new paradigm. Um, historically, I think uh, it was first Larry Smith who uh, talked about the new paradigm of English as an international language back in 1983. He brought to our attention that you know, now non-native speakers of English often use or frequently use English to speak to other non-native speakers, and they need training for that. And he also said that even native speakers um, would need training to be able to speak to non-native speakers of the language or speakers of other varieties of English. But really, uh, it was uh, probably not until uh, the publication of Sandy, uh, Sandra McKay's um, Teaching English as an International Language that the the new paradigm um, started to uh, really emerge or re-emerge, if you like. I have defined in the 2009 um, edited volume, I have defined EIL as a paradigm for thinking, research, and practice. As I said before, um, often a paradigm uh, shift is associated with certain new observations. The observations in the case of the English language relate to the changes to the English language as a result of the global um, globalization of the language as well as the localization of the language, which um, collectively I refer to as globalization of English. Um, the changes, according to Sandra McKay, the changes uh, to the English language have um, resulted from the continued spread of English accompanied by growth in the number of bilingual speakers of English and the expanding forces of globalization as well as a breakthrough in technology. So all these forces have led to the um, significant changes to the English language. I have tried to conceptualize the changes to the English language in three interrelated categories um, or I have looked at the changes from three interrelated uh, perspectives. One is demographic, um, another one geographic, geographical and, and structural. The demographic changes uh, to the language relate to the number of non-native speakers of English. David Crystal uh, brought to our attention that now more than 80% of communication in English today is between the so-called non-native speakers of English. So this is the demographic uh, changes to the users of English or speakers of English. Geographically, now English um, has official, an official or a special status in more than 75 countries or territories around the world with a total population of over 2 billion speakers or users of English. Structural changes to the English language relate to the development of more and more world Englishes, varieties of English, um, such as China English, Japanese English, and a lot more Englishes. And of course, uh, also structural changes to the English language are partly as a result of these world Englishes influencing each other. I'll be talking about this a bit more later. So this is how I uh, diagrammatically uh, view these interrelated changes to the English language. So David, as I said, David Crystal um, provided estimates of uh, speakers of English, well I said, you know, more than 1.5 billion speakers of English exist around the world. 400 million speak it as L1, 600 million speak it as L2, and 600 million speak it as a foreign language. 
And, and of course, um, David Gradle has questioned the validity of these classifications of L1, L2, and foreign language in today's world. More and more, um, L2 speakers are becoming L1 speakers, and foreign language speakers are becoming L2 speakers, second language speakers. So this classification is already blurred with the changes to the um, English language. David Gradle talked about the decline of the native speaker. You know, he said the proportion of the world's population speaking English as a first language is declining and will continue to do so for a foreseeable uh, future. And he said the international status of English is changing in profound ways. In future, it will be a language used mainly um, in multilingual context as a second language for communication between non-native speakers. Now, each of these uh, interrelated changes, I think, has pushed a particular research agenda. Um, for example, the demographic uh, changes to the English language have um, pushed research uh, areas such as English as a lingua franca studies. Here I'm referring to the work of people like Bob, Barbara Seidelhofer and Jennifer Jenkins, Anna Moranen, Andy Kirkpatrick, Alan Firth, um, and so on. The, the question uh, or the aim of English as a lingua franca or ELF research, if you like, is to examine ELF corpora, um, to examine and to, 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 uh, to see if they can find um, cases, possible cases of innovations, for example, lexical innovations in ELF communication. <clears throat> also exploring um, cases of divergence and convergence in ELF communication. Um, finding communicative strategies that are specific to ELF communication. Um, we have seen also demographic changes, you know, pushing the studies of ownership of English and attitude towards Englishes um, in a particular way. Now, you know, in terms of ownership, uh, people are examining whether or not native speakers of English see themselves as the guardians, as the owners of the English language, or do they view um, the traditional native speakers of the language as the only uh, owners of the language, what does the development of these new varieties of English, like China English, mean for perception of the ownership? Do speakers perceive English or their Englishes, if you like, as the property rather than um, property of the native speakers or not? In terms of attitudes, uh, studies uh, are now looking at or have been looking at attitudes of learners as well as teachers' attitudes towards different varieties of English from all uh, different circles. I'm talking about Kachru's uh, three concentric circles, inner circle, outer circle, and expanding circle countries. Um, because the attitudes towards uh, these varieties have got important implications for teaching of English and Englishes, if you like. In terms of identity, uh, the, the growth of identity studies in, in, within the paradigm of English as an international language. As we know, language is closely linked to our identity and um, it's one of the phenomena through which we project our identities. Um, this line of research explores perceptions of identity in relation to language among learners as well as teachers. Um, learners, we know, often um, aspire to acquire and project certain identities through uh, how they sound, for example, in L2. Um, we have started to see also um, questions of possible conflict or um, projections of local versus social versus global identities in terms of lear learners. Do learners um, feel that they can um, project their local identity through English, or would they prefer um, to project more global identities through English? So there are a lot of questions and interesting um, areas of research. 
related to identity studies. Also, demographic changes um, to the English language have pushed research in the area of uh, EIL curriculum. Um, the, I mean, people like Sandra McKay and James Dean Brown have written on EIL curriculum. The questions in, in this area relate to, first of all, the cultural content of um, EIL curriculum. Whose culture should be represented, local, global, international? And also, um, the, the, another question is uh, to do with the representation of speakers or varieties of English in ELT materials. As we know, traditionally, you know, ELT materials represented mainly British English and American English. So now, should ELT materials now include more cases of L2, L2 interaction rather than interactions between native speakers and non-native speakers? because, as we said, more than 80% of communication is now between non-native speakers, should EIL curriculum reflect this pattern of use of English in the world? Um, also, I think EIL um, paradigm and uh, traditional research in intercultural communication have come closer to each other because now there is recognition, more and more recognition, that the cases of use of English uh, around the world are actually cases of um, not only intercultural communication, but multicultural communication in which in one conversation, for example, we have people coming from various uh, cultural backgrounds and they bring their cultural norms into the use of English. Um, we have seen, for example, in recent years that people like Michael Byram um, have introduced the notion of intercultural communicative competence as one of the key competencies in the area of English language teaching or foreign language um, teaching and learning. Um, so the question here now is that what sort of communicative, communicative uh, or intercultural communication skills do learners need to acquire to be able to succeed in uh, the use of English as an international language? Um, in my own work um, in the area of cultural linguistics, I have talked about the um, notion of metacultural competence as one of the competencies that we would need to promote among our learners to be able to succeed in the use of English as an international language. I have used the, the term metacultural competence to refer to a competence that enables interlocutors to communicate and nego negotiate their cultural conceptualizations. Here I'm referring to cultural schemas, cultural categories, and cultural metaphors during the process of intercultural communication. This competence is developed as a result of exposure and conscious exposure to and familiarity with various systems of cultural conceptualizations through, again, exposure to uh, different varieties of English, world Englishes. Geographic uh, changes to the English language um, have pushed um, the research agenda in what I would, um, or what has been categorized broadly as critical applied linguistics. So here I'm referring to the work of people like you know, Robert Philipson and uh, Alastair Pennycook who um, examine the role of English versus other languages. Does the spread of English uh, serve as a killer language to other languages? Does, does the promotion of English um, lead to the demise and the death of other languages? Um, the rapid global spread of English has continued to fuel the debate about the role of English versus other languages and the thesis of uh, linguistic imperialism. So Robert Philipson recently published um, Linguistic Imperialism Continued, and he's exploring how the spread of English um, has continued to disadvantage uh, certain communities of uh, speakers. But we also have the geographic changes to the English language have also um, been associated with 
um, macro sociolinguistic studies, studies that look at the spread of English in terms of language shift, language maintenance, and the replacement, language replacement and delimitation and interaction of speech communities. Um, recently, we have seen also um, EIL as a critical multilingual paradigm. Um, for example, the work of Ryoko uh, Kubota. So in line with uh, what uh, Kubota says, I believe EIL paradigm uh, is a paradigm for promoting border crossing communication to foster critical awareness of power and privilege attached to English attitudes towards affirming differences and communicating across differences and skills to use communicative strategies in and beyond English. Scholars like um, Ryoko, who subscribe to this um, anti-normative, um, if you like, um, approaches to EIL, would like to see EIL as a multilingual paradigm uh, rather than a paradigm that fosters uh, and promotes monolingual mindset. So a lot of EIL scholars are aware of the danger of promoting English at the cost of um, sort of the death of other languages and, and um, against multilingualism and bilingualism. And I certainly subscribe to that view myself. Structural changes to the English language, as I said before, they they're mainly due to the development, as I said, well, the, these are really interrelated. So demographic, geographic, and structural changes are very much interrelated. So the expansion of, uh, in, in terms of the number of speakers of English has led to the development of more and more world Englishes. <clears throat> particularly in expanding circle countries. Um, so now there are studies looking at um, attitudes towards these new varieties of English, such as China English. Um, there are also dialect contact studies now uh, looking at how these world Englishes and the developing uh, Englishes influence each other. And I'm not just talking about uh, American English influencing Australian English, but Asian Englishes, for example, influencing each other because of now the role of English in ASEAN or in sort of um, in Europe, um, European Union or African Union, where English becomes the language of uh, one of the common languages in the continent. Uh, but of course there are different varieties and when people communicate with each other, these varieties of English such as Singaporean English, Malaysian English, um, China English and other Englishes, they influence each other as well. So the contact between uh, um, speakers or uh, what you might refer to as non-native speakers in their own varieties also influence the varieties of world Englishes. There has also been uh, the research uh, question about what model or what varieties should we use in English language teaching. Andy Kirkpatrick has written about this. So the question is whether or not in, in a country like India or, or Malaysia, should the model for English language teaching be the local variety, the nativized variety, or um, one of the uh, lingua francas varieties in the region or one of the um, native, um, native language varieties. So there are healthy debates, if you like, about um, what model should be, should be used in English language teaching. Of course, my own um, thinking in this area is whether or not we need a model um, or can we do without really having a model for English language teaching if the reality, sociolinguistic reality, that our learners are gonna face is not gonna be a model, but actually multivarietal um, communicative contexts. The role of world Englishes in English language, te in teaching English as an international language has also been uh, examined by people like, you know, Aya Matsuda. Um, she's been looking at the, uh, the role of uh, 
studies of world Englishes in teacher, in ELT teacher preparation and uh, perceptions of teachers about whether or not they would need to know about world Englishes um, as part of their training. Um, I have also, uh, in my own research, I've looked at uh, world Englishes from the perspective of cultural linguistics. I've looked at, you know, um, the ways in which these uh, Englishes encode cultural conceptualizations of the speakers. Um, one of the most important um, implications for um, of, of uh, the paradigm of English language English as an international language um, is obviously for English language teaching. Um, people like uh, Jack Richards uh, have uh, emphasized the importance of the paradigm of English language teach English as an international language for English language teaching in um, Jack's own words the concept of English as an international language or lingua franca has a number of important implications for English teaching. In the past, English was often regarded as the property of native speakers of English and of countries where it has the status of a mother tongue or first language for the majority of the population. Um, and he says, English is no longer viewed as the property of the English-speaking world, but is an international commodity. Um, in line with what I said before, that you know, speakers um, may feel that English n is now a tool for the expression of their cultural identity. This is what um, Jack Richard says, that the speakers may wish to preserve markers of their cultural identity through the way they speak English. Well, and as for the um, implication for English language teaching, Jack Richard um, emphasizes that in teaching, then we need to be careful in terms of our attitudes towards the kind of English our students hear and the kind of English our students produce. Let's be more flexible. My understanding of what Jack Richard says here is that in EIL classrooms, then um, learners should be exposed to uh, multiple varieties of English as much as possible. This is not for learners to develop proficiency in multiple varieties of English, but to develop uh, competence in um, multiple varieties of English so that they can understand different varieties of English. In terms of what learners produce, again, um, Jack Richards uh, asks us to be flexible in terms of what students produce. And I, I believe... Um, this is uh, to do with um, the ways in which now learners um, may produce what I have called transvarietal Englishes. No matter what we use as a model, British English or American English, I think in many cases uh, learners produce um, the kind of English that includes features from different varieties of English, including their local Englishes, as well as features that are not part of any established varieties of English, um, innovations, if you like. So I, I would say in um, English language teaching, even in the traditional system, the students had exposure to both American English and British English, and you know, in their production, you could see features of both. But now, uh, because of the interaction with so many varieties of English, I think the kind of English that students produce would have features from many, as I said, several varieties of English, as well as features from their L1, as, as well as uh, features that are <coughs> not part of any of these. And so we, we should look at learners' uh, Englishes in their own um, right. So then Jack Richard continues. Um, he says, let's acknowledge the fact that English is an international language and can be used by different people according to the circumstances and the purposes for which they need it. In the area of um, language testing and the notion of proficiency, um, there have been um, some debates about um, the ways in which we need to look at proficiency differently. For example, Suresh Kanagaraja um, maintains that 
in a context where we have to constantly shuttle between different varieties of English and communities, proficiency becomes complex. One needs the capacity to negotiate diverse varieties to facilitate communication. And he talks about multi-dialectal competence and he says, we need uh, our learners uh, and, and the concept of proficiency needs um, to include the concept of multi-dialectal competence, part of which is passive competence to understand new varieties of English. Um, other people have talked about language testing and the need for the inclusion of um, implications from research, uh, EIL research in the area of English language testing as well. For example, who um, says, uh, he observes that traditional assessment practices and principles do not take heed of the changing demographics of EIL users and the shifting geopolitic, uh, political context of EIL users. Um, and David, uh, Peter Lowenberg also has done a lot of work on um, the idea of um, English language testing and world Englishes. And he says this diversification of English in non-native contexts is clearly a significant variable that can no longer be ignored in the assessment of language proficiency. And of course, I understand that you know, uh, IELTS Australia, uh, uh, Cambridge ESOL, as well as uh, um, English language testing services, um, they all are now very much working towards developing uh, proficiency tests, um, international tests that are sensitive to the changes to the English language um, within the paradigm of uh, EIL. So, in summary, um, this is how I see diagrammatically how I see the paradigm of English as an international language as sort of um, having um, bits and pieces of strands of research um, under one umbrella paradigm. Of course, I've talked about uh, teaching EIL and cultural linguistics and EIL, social psychology of EIL, identity studies, critical applied linguistics, um, macro sociolinguistics, world Englishes, intercultural communication. Um, I haven't talked about CMC, uh, computer-mediated uh, communication in EIL, because I think it's really, really in its infancy at the moment, and we need to see more in um, this area of research, the role of uh, computer-mediated communication um, in English as an international language in terms of the changes to the English language and in terms of English language teaching as well. My final note is a tribute to my uh, colleague, late Professor Michael Klein, um, where in, in an article on English as an international language, Michael raised some um, responses to the uh, globalization of English. Um, according to Michael, what is needed is a more understanding or more symmetrical understanding of the pluricentricity of English in the sense that um, we should look at different varieties of English in equal terms, um, not some varieties are better than other varieties of English. And he advocated the um, instruction in both English as a second language and English as a first language, which focuses on cross-cultural, intercultural communication, especially on pragmatic discourse and conceptual variation. And, and Michael always advocated a policy of bilingualism and multilingualism to accompany the acquisition and use of English, including that by speakers from inner circle nations. Thank you very much. <laughs>